So welcome back my friends. As if we didn't have enough projects started around this place, I want to start another one today. A couple weeks back in the comments section, a guy named Jason suggested that I pick up some of these. This is the Black Hills Ammunition 77 grain open tip match. Yep, this is the stuff. Now the military uses this stuff and Black Hills manufactures this for them as the uh, Mark 262 Mod 1. So that's the plan for this little series. These guys aren't terribly uh, interesting to look at, you know, just kind of looks like some normal 5.56 ammo with an open tip match bullet in it. It is in uh, Lake City brass with uh, 2016 head stamps. We're going to get into the physical characteristics of these guys a lot. A lot. That's basically this whole video is talking about the parts of the ammunition, tearing some rounds apart, and basically doing everything we can to figure out how to clone this guy. And we're also going to get out to the range and shoot a couple initial test groups to see how well this shoots in our white oak armament barrel. One warning I should give right here at the beginning. This is a this is an exercise best left to experienced folks. These have crazy high velocity. So it's going to be a real challenge to match the velocity of these guys with our own stuff and stay within acceptable pressure level. So we're going to be riding the line of max charge basically through this whole series. It's going to be several videos. This is just the introduction. We're going to talk about components and stuff. And then we're going to have additional videos testing powders. So we're already talking about 556 five, pressures, you know, a little higher than 223. So if you're not careful, you could definitely blow your face off taking this uh, project on. So we're just going to be careful. I just wanted to warn you guys, like this video, we're going to talk a lot about potential powders and charge weights and what we can do. It is all preliminary. And that's another thing you need to be careful of, you know, like as we go along, you know, if I come up with charge weights, it's very likely, very likely we'll go out to the range and hit high pressure and have to stop. So just a little warning. And you know, this is my first time down this road as well. I've never really shot the 77 grain match King very much, which I guess I forgot to mention that. This is by all accounts, the bullet they use. This is a 77 grain Sierra match King with a cantalure. You can see there, it says seven and eight inch twist barrels only. My white oak armament barrel is a one and eight twist. So hopefully we don't run into any problems related to that. But if you've got a one and nine twist, you might still be okay maybe, but anything slower than that, you're definitely in trouble. The bullet just won't stabilize properly. Okay, so like I said, there's a lot of conflicting information out there and I still don't have the story straight. This Mark 262 ammunition came out, like I don't know, 15 years ago, and they had problems with temperature stability. Most of this crap is coming from Wikipedia pages and random forum posts. So this might all be BS, but that's what I've read. The initial load had temperature stability problems. So they reformulated the powder and re-released it as the 262 mod one. So this should be 262 mod one ammo. Somewhere along this, the same time, like that, that original mod zero ammo was loaded with a 77 grain match King without the cantalure. So somewhere along the way, Black Hills went over to Nosler and said, hey Nosler, can you make us a similar bullet but have a cantalure? And they did. So then for a while, this ammo was loaded with Nosler. 77 grain, I think it's custom competition. They're, they're 77 grain open tip match bullet. Then Sierra decided to go ahead and add the cantalure and they switched back, I guess. And somewhere along in there, there was another powder reformulation because of continued temperature instability. And that brings us to today. And also Black Hills loads this exact same ammo with the tipped match King, same velocity, same everything, which their, their advertised velocity for these guys are 2750. And the details are a little slim on their site, but my understanding is that is what they advertise for an 18 inch barrel. This was really designed for like the, uh, the Mark 12 SPR rifle. And then like the, the, the scar, the light scars. So I guess that's where, you know, this stuff has primarily been used in the military, but they, yeah, there's been a couple reformulations and all of that stuff. So who knows? A lot of people out there, you know, looking to clone the round do use the Nosler bullet and certainly nothing wrong with that. Now this stuff is not cheap. It is not even close to being cheap. At Brownells, uh, where I bought this, it's 53.70 for a box of 50. So a dollar seven each. 
you can buy a case of 500, which brings the price down to a dollar and five cents a piece. So 500 of these guys is $524 and 38 cents. Pretty expensive. Now this bullet is an expensive bullet. I bought, this is their 500 pack and this was right at $135. So you're looking at about 27 cents a piece for the bullet. Not terribly cheap, but if we take a 27 cent bullet powder, I was calculating it roughly 11 cents and three cents for a primer means if we can successfully clone this, we'll be, we'll be loading our own for 41 cents, not counting brass. We don't count brass around here. You pick up brass at the rain. So 41 cents or $205 total to load up this full box of 500. So $205 for 500 this way or $524 for 500 of factory ammo. For a savings on your first 500 rounds of $319.38. Holy crap, that's a load of cash. So if you're buying this stuff, if you're actually shooting this stuff and buying it by the case of 500, I got news for you, brother. The price difference of reloading 500 of them versus buying 500 of them is enough money to buy an entire reloading setup and pretty decent stuff too. I'm going to have a link down in the description for a full kit, everything you'll need to reload 5.56 and 2.23. And it's roughly the same price as the, uh, the cost difference between these two. Now, of course I say this right after I got done giving a warning that this really is not a beginner's undertaking, but I was more thinking about those of you who have like super hateful wives or something just never stops nagging and you've got to justify everything. This is it brother. You've already had the fight about buying the ammo. You're already buying it. So the next time you go to order, you just go, Oh, Hey, look, I can either five order 500 more of these, or I can order everything I need to reload 500 this way. You confront her with simple math of like basically a free reloading kit. And I don't, I don't see how she can, uh, I don't see how she can deny you that. Plus you can use the fact that like, okay, well, and then from, from then on, I'm going to be getting 500 for 200 bucks instead of 500 plus. All right. Enough of that. You're going to save a ton of money. There's no doubt about that, but we've just, we need to successfully clone it. First. All right. So now that we've talked about it, we know what it is. We know the plan, the goal for this little video series. Let's go on out to the range. I shot 15 of these guys just for some initial accuracy and velocity testing. So let's run out and shoot those guys real quick. All right, guys, so this is crazy good. This is stupid good. First five was a 616. Second five was a 553. Five, Last five was a 618. This is really good shooting, brother. That 0.5 barrier, it seems to be a barrier for me. So what we're basically, basically looking at is as good as I can shoot from the prone and a rear bag and a bipod. But this gives us a good, a good goal to shoot for. Now my, I walked, I went out there. My original plan was to shoot the first group with my suppressor and chronograph and all of that crap. And then I was going to shoot a group without the chronograph and then shoot a, gra a group without the, sur the suppressor or the chronograph. Just so, you know, people who like to whine about the chronograph or the suppressor would be able to see what was actually going on. This, this is too good. There's absolutely no point. So Mark 262 shoots this good 
with my suppressor, with my chronograph. Our cloned ammo needs to shoot this well with those tools attached. So, no whining about that stuff being attached during this series. It'll be on there the whole time. The velocity on these first 15 shots was fascinating. Let's look, I, I put them on a quick chart because I don't know if you noticed, you know, during the range time there, but our velocity did seem to be slowly creeping up. And, and there was this bizarre sawtooth pattern as well, where one shot would be low, one shot would be high, the next one would be low. And yeah, you're looking at it. You see what I'm talking about. That's a little crazy. But if we look at the numbers, so the first five, 2742, and then the last five, 2763, pretty respectable standard deviation numbers all around. You know, we can tighten that up a little bit, but yeah, I wish those were a little bit tighter, but you can't argue with the groups. So it's going to take further testing to find out whether this was temperature related or not. I, I certainly didn't let the, uh, the rounds cook in the chamber for a long time or anything like that. I took my time, you know, on the 15 shots, but it, it didn't take all that long to shoot them. So the barrel definitely started getting hot towards the end and this velocity crept up. But yeah, we'll just, we'll just have to test it later, find out whether this is some characteristic of my gun heating up or whether it's temperature instability somehow of the ammo. So let's talk a little bit about the physical characteristics we can see of the ammo without tearing it apart. You know, we just pull it out and look at it and say, wow, look at that. As I already mentioned, this is, it's all Lake City brass with 2016 head stamps. They do use a primer sealant. Some of the rounds you can see a little purple stuff around the primer. We are not going to be sealing any primers. You can buy a kit and you're more than welcome to, but I can't imagine any scenario where I would need a primer sealed. The next thing I did was I took overall lengths for all 50 of them. And here it is on a chart. Our shortest guy down there was 2.240 and our longest guy was 2.251. So it looked like 2.246 was our most common number there. This was a little shorter than I expected. I figured they'd be stretched out to full magazine length, but seems they leave a little buffer there, which is nice. Now this doesn't necessarily tell the whole story, right? That, that number is overall length from the base to the tip of the bullet, just like that. And the problem with this reading, especially with open tip match bullets, is these always have very irregular tips. Like the meat plat of the bullet is sometimes cut a little crooked and just looking a little bit wonky. So especially with open tip match bullets, it's not uncommon to uh, deal with some variation in overall length. But the other thing I did is I measured each one, yeah, from the cartridge base, right at the base of the round. My camera's being a little bit goofy, isn't it? Okay, let's try this again. Yeah, that's a little bit better. All right, we're in this one, we're measuring cartridge base to the O drive of the bullet. Now, this is a much st more stable reading because, you know, you don't have to deal with those Miplat irregularities. So let's look at the chart for this. Now, that's a much more acceptable looking distribution. We did have a couple short guys, you know, those three down there that only have a single, but the vast majority were there at 1.872 to 1.874 for that measurement. So if you don't have a Hornady bullet comparator set, you might want to pick one of those up. If you're having, you know, just like this with this bullet, if you're trying to set overall length and having frustrations, the bullet comparator just makes the, makes the job a whole lot easier. The other thing I measured, I wasn't really expecting a repeatable measurement, but I got one. I was trying to measure the crimp. So I put my calipers right about there, just low enough so that you're definitely clear of any crimp. And I'm getting a very consistent 247 on all of them. Now, if I reposition my caliper to right at the mouth of the case, it comes out to 245. So it's two thousandths smaller there than it is just a little bit lower. So every single one I've tested has been exactly the same. 247 below the mouth, 245 right at the mouth. So it looks like a total of about two thousands of crimp, measurable crimp there. So I pulled these guys apart, right? I took five cases. I sacrificed five cases and tore them completely apart to take some measurements. And now I want to run through them all component by component. And the easiest place, at least I thought initially, is with the bullet. We already know what bullet we're shooting. So this picture here, the five bullets on the left are the ones that I pulled. And f the five bullets on the right are the new Sierra Match Kings. The little mark on the left-hand ones 
right above the cantaloupe was caused by me. That that's where I used a collet bullet puller to pull these guys and they were in there pretty good. I had to get a good grip on them and it just marked up the bullets. So that's where that came from. But I pulled these bullets out and start looking at them like, this is not the same bullet. Just look at the, look at the length there. I mean, you can eyeball it. The five on the left are clearly a good bit shorter than the five on the right. You can't see it very well in this picture, but the cantalures don't line up. The, the cantalures on the right are a little higher than the ones on the left. So I started taking the measurements I could think of. First of all, bullet weight. The pulled bullets, 76.94, and the new bullets, 76.92. Perfect, they're both 76.9. I used my Jim Pro scale, you know, that read to the 200th, so I went ahead and added that in there, whatever. But for all intents and purposes, they weigh identically the same. The length of the bullet is significantly different. The ones on the left, 0.997, our pulled bullets are 0.997 and our new Sierra bullets are 1.012. That's 15 thousandths. That's not insignificant. And I also measured the base of the bullet up to the, the, the ogive with the uh, Hornady bullet comparator. And that one, it's 16 thousandths longer. So it looks like this bullet is not only 15 or 16 thousandths longer total length, it's that much longer base to ogive as well. So the additional weight is somewhere in the middle, I guess. These have got to be nozzlers, right? I've been looking around. I don't have any 77 nozzlers here on hand, unfortunately. But looking at pictures and stuff online, I'm pretty sure these are nozzlers. So at first I was thinking like, crap, maybe I got uh, a really old box of ammo. I'm sure, I mean, this crap's so expensive. I'm sure it doesn't exactly fly off the shelves. But I looked at the, the lot number and it's in Greek. Oh, there it is. Yeah, see, these are from 1920. That's old. That's almost a hundred years old. So I guess maybe these head stamps, these uh, Lake City 16 head stamps are actually from 1916, maybe. Yeah, so I don't know, man. The ammo is not that old, you know? The brass is from last year, so from what I read, they weren't supposed to be using nozzlers for a long time. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there, but there's no way this is the same bullet. Pretty much has to be the nozzler. Now, moving right along to brass, this one's gonna be easy. We're all very familiar with Lake City brass, right? Yeah, good old Lake City. You got this stuff running out of your ears, right? You got a big old stockpile of it. You've been picking it up at the range, whatever. It's good brass, it's excellent brass. Like I mentioned, you know, just like all Lake City brass, it's got the same annealing coloration and this did have a primp, uh, crimped primer. So just what you would expect. So I dug through my brass stockpiles and was able to come up with about 70 pieces of virgin once fired Lake City brass. It hasn't even had the primer popped out. So this is all once fired Lake City. I think this is what we'll use for our videos, at least initially. Actually, I might add the 15 shots of Black Hills that I've already fired. I might just go ahead and add that. Add those 15 to this. There's nothing special about the brass and I've inspected them pretty well. So nothing really special to see here. So those 15 will probably go into our brass collection to join the party. And, and this brass here, unfortunately, I don't have all uh, matching head stamps. I've got a bunch of 13s in here, like 40 of them are, are 2013. And then there's a, a few 2015s and 2016s. No big deal. If we run into any problems with the brass, I've got tons of this stuff, but most of it has just already been prepped or fired before or something. And I figured I would just start with some, some virgin once fired stuff, but we run into any problems. I mean, actually right back there is a hundred pieces of Lake city, right? Waiting on some, uh, some videos with the Bob's bullet with the Bob's 55 grain full metal jacket bow tail bullet. So that's, that's the plan on brass. So on the subject of primers, I've got seven of them. We actually just did a primer shootout sort of video. All right, so here's the clip of the, the seven primers I've got on the left and the five that I pulled out of our Black Hills ammo on the right. The top four can all be eliminated as perfect matches simply because they're silver instead of brass colored, but none of them are a perfect match. You look inside of the Black Hills one, you see that, you know, kind of orange, color there and most of ours have like yellow or the Winchester down there has that really dark blue. 
but none are a match and not of and none of and none of them are even really close but if you look at the anvil design the way the des, way the anvil looks these do match the cci closest all four of our cci primers kind of use the same looking design so that would probably be closest now as you see i actually weighed these stupid things and they ranged from like the, the lightest was the winchester wsr at 3.22 grains and they went all the way up to the CCI BR4 at 3.8 grains. And I was surprised with the consistency on the weight of these. Like I, I measured five of each and took an average and they were all within a uh, couple hundred grain, couple hundredths of a grain from uh, their other like partners. So very consistent weight and none of them match what we pulled out of our uh, Mark 232 ammo. So. We don't have anything that weighs the same and we don't have anything that looks the same. What I think I'm going to do, what I think I'm going to start out with is the CCI 41. The CCI number 41 seems to be the closest match. You know, if you look at the anvil shape and uh, cup, the color of the cup and all of that stuff, it seems to be pretty close. And now the CCI number 41, I've gone through quite a few boxes of them and you'll see different looking primers in them sometimes. I didn't have many, but I happened to have this one little sleeve of primers left over from a box. And you can see I've written ciders on it. Just use them for ciders because they're totally different from anything else I've got. Totally different color in there and all that crap. But it's still a CCI 41. I, I weighed them out. They weigh exactly the same as the other CCI 41s. So I'm wondering if there's just, you know, different plants or something making the same thing, but they use slightly different stuff. I don't know, man, but I think we're going to go with the CCI 41. We've got more options here if we need to try something else. So when I dumped the powder, what I found was a ball powder, a spherical powder, which wasn't a huge surprise after hearing about all of the temperature sensitivity issues this round has had in the past. Ball powders are generally a little bit worse about that than extruded powders. The charge weights were pretty consistent. The lightest was 25.54 and the highest was 25.74. So about a two, two tenth of a grain swing there. So that was good to see. But the charge weight itself is higher than I thought, higher than I expected. 25.62 grains of whatever this mystery powder is. That's a ton of powder. Now, the fact that it's a large powder charge means it's almost certainly on the very slow side of the normal 223 powder range. Tell you what, let's have a quick look at the burn at the burn rate chart. So the part I've clipped out here is from number 75 down to number 126. The lower the number, the faster burning the powder. So the range I'm showing you here includes almost all of the powders that you would use in 223. So Hodgson H330, 322 there, number 75, that is a very fast powder for the cartridge. Generally used with lighter bullets and you generally end up with, uh, you know, lower velocity if you try to use it with higher bullets because you just can't use that much powder because of pressure, right? It's a fast powder, that pressure is going to spike sooner. So you're limited by that. So as the bullet weights go up, if you go to slower and slower powders, that's what you'll get. But... Because they're slower, you need to up the charge weight. So as you go with slower powders, generally the charge, you know, your, your maximum charge weight or the charge weight for some given velocity will go up and up and up until eventually you get to powders that are so slow, you can't jam enough powder in the case. Or you get to a very slow powder and it's not getting burned completely in the barrel and you're basically blowing unburnt powder out the barrel. One stupid way I like to think about burn rate is let's say you had a small compact car sitting here on blacktop in neutral and you need to move it three feet. That's not too hard. You go around the back, you put your palms on it and you push it. it takes a lot of force to get going, but once it's going, you're good and yeah, not a huge deal. So that would be the equivalent of a slow powder. Imagine you took all of the energy you expended pushing the car and concentrated it, all of it concentrated it into a single punch. And instead of pushing the car three feet, you were gonna punch it one time and make it go three feet. It should take about the same energy, more or less, right? But the problem is your fist can't handle the pressure, right? So you hit a car very hard with your fist, you're gonna have pressure problems. 
So that that's a fast powder. Pushing is a slow powder. Punching is a fast powder. And like I said, it's all dependent on bullet weight. A car is an extremely heavy object. Now, if you switch that to a baseball, let's say you want to you want to move a baseball ten feet, you can walk it over there and sit it down, or you can just pick it up and throw it. You were able to so that 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 energy, that force that it took to physically carry it over there, you were able to just concentrate it, turn it into a throw. But a nice light baseball, you're not going to break your hand, right? So it's all about the weight of the object or your bullet and the speed of the powder, and they need to match just right. And like I said, you go too slow, you run out of case capacity. So keeping all of that crazy stuff in mind, the burn rate chart here, I circled all of the ball powders that I thought might have a chance of working for us, or that might actually be the powder that's in this Black Hills ammunition. So. Once I had, you know, the powders I wanted to look at identified, I pulled these guys up and, and did a very generic run and quick load for a 77 grain match king and an 18 inch barrel with, you know, basically all the defaults and ran each of these through to see what max charge it gave me. And this is what I ended up with. So the top powder Winchester 760 is the slowest one I looked at and all the way down at the bottom H335 is the fastest one I looked at. And just like I was mentioning, if you look at the max charge column, you'll notice the slowest powder we look at, Winchester 760, has the largest charge weight, 26.1 grains. All the way down at the bottom, H335, the fastest powder, it's 22.8 grains. And just like we were talking about running out of case capacity, you can see the case fill column, that Winchester 760 load is 113% full. That's too much. Sometimes, you know, it depends on the cartridge and stuff, but I think in a 223 where the, you know, the neck's pretty small and that's going to get right up in that neck and probably be a pain in the butt to compress. Assuming you, we can even get it in there and get a bullet on there and start compressing it. So yeah, way too much case fill with Winchester 760. Now, if you remember back to the powder in our Black Hills ammunition, the charge weight was 25.62 grains. I don't see anything on this list that makes me think one of these is our Black Hills powder. Yeah, I, I just, I don't think it's on our list. You know, th these ammunition companies have access to additional powders that we don't have access to as reloaders. So that's probably, you know, what's going on. So you can see, I highlighted a couple in the middle in green. These are the ones I think show the most promise. The obvious place to look is the velocity column. These guys are, are some of our fastest powders. The case fill is, it looks good. It's just over a hundred percent. So it's going to be a nice full case, lightly compressed, should lead to some accuracy. And then the last column there, the burned percentage, you can see that it's between 97 and 99% burned. So good velocity, good case fill, and it's all getting burned. You see lever evolution there. That guy wasn't in my version of quick load, so I wasn't able to run the numbers for that guy, but I want to add it to the list and, and test it out because th these powders, these are the same powders that I use in 6.5 Grindel. It's a lot of the same powders we were looking at for 22 Nosler. As we get going with that, these are the powders we're going to use. So, you know, with 6.5 Grindel as an example, CFE 223 is one of the best powders and I'm hearing good things about lever evolution as far as velocity goes. I haven't got to try it yet. I've got a pound, but I don't think I've tried it yet. So even though it's all question marks right now, I think we're going to be good to try that guy and see what sort of numbers we get. Now, just as a note, these numbers, these max charges, these are 556 pressure. This is not 223. So these are very hot. At least several of the charges on this graphic are dangerously over pressure. There's no doubt about it. Just with, you know, my experience of using quick load poorly, it doesn't always line up and occasionally it could get you into trouble. So, okay. So we've got our green powders that we want to try. So let's have an actual look at them. So in addition to the ones we're going to continue to try, I also th threw in Winchester 760 and H380 just to give you, you know, give you a look. None of these look like Black Hills. They really don't, right? None of them are close. You have to look closely, 
but the flake shape is different and a lot of these powders have the flattened flakes more than the Black Hills. So yeah, none of these are a perfect match for the Black Hills powder. Pretty close, but not quite. So if we go back to the burn rate chart, you might be looking at this and you know, we've already looked at the ball powders and you're, you're thinking, man, what about my favorite extruded powder? I love Varget or whatever, you know? I did run some numbers for some extruded powders. Here are some circles. These are the ones that I ran. So you can see pretty nice distribution across that same range. You know, our 223, 556 range. So let's go to the chart. Just from experience, my best bet here is AR comp. I really like those numbers. So I came up with a max charge of 22.1 grains, but I think I've gotten in trouble with AR comp in the past. So this is definitely one of the ones that I would really want to sneak up on that max charge because AR comp can kind of get away from you if you're not careful. Case fill of 105%, that should be fine. We should be able to uh, crunch that in no problem. Velocity of 2752 and 100% burned by the end of the barrel. That's looking pretty good. I was surprised the highest number came from IMR 4895. 23.6 grains of 4895, you know, showed uh, 2,760 feet per second. So that's my current thought on extruded powders. We're, we're gonna start with the ball powders. Let's see how far we can get with the ball powders, you know, do a, a normal clone, you know, do a true clone of the ammo, but long-term, I would really prefer an extruded powder if we can get the velocity out of it. Like I said, they're generally more temperature stable than ball powders. And I've just had more luck getting good accuracy out of extruded powders than ball powders, just overall. But that's why I wanna stick with the ball powders because by God, if they can do it, we can do it, right? I got, yeah, I think CFE 223 or Lever Evolution, I think is gonna be the ticket. We're gonna be rocking and rolling. So the length of this video just got way out of hand. So we're gonna end it right here. That's basically our situation. We've got our ammo and our components. We've got our powders picked out. We've got all of our components picked out. We've baselined the ammo and we're ready to rock. So very next video, I wanna jump right into it and try out some of our ball powders. CFE 223 is definitely gonna be one of the first ones I test, but I'm gonna to have to think about it a little while to pick out the other one. Several good options to play with. So all right, that's where we're gonna end it. If you'd like to contribute to the bullet budget around this dump, check me out at patreon.com reloading, and I will see you guys tomorrow.